uh, anymore. Um, cool. All right. Give me one second here. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for bearing with us as we as we conquered the technological demons, the ghosts in the machine. Hi, I'm Brian Gresko. Welcome to the Antibody, a quarantine reading series as part of LitHub's virtual book channel. I'm coming to you live from my writing studio in Brooklyn, where you might hear a firework exploding in the air outside or a firecracker popping. Uh, the past few nights, people seem to be pulling up to our corner and just letting them rip and then driving off. And I will, um, I will just, just a warning, because it might get loud, but I will spare you my firework conspiracy theories. Um, and we'll just keep going, going on with the show. Noise aside, I've been grateful for these very long uh, summer nights, and I'm really grateful that you chose to spend this one with, with three wonderful writers who are going to share their work with us. Uh, Zena Arafat is here, Diksha Basu is here, and Annie Kim is here. Um, and I hope that everyone, wherever it is that you're joining us from, will join me in just taking a deep breath and just relaxing your body in so that you can, can settle in with a snack or a glass of wine and appreciate their artistry. Um, I will keep this short because I think that in the audience, everyone's here, um, everyone's been here before. Um, your mics are on mute. I ask you, please keep them that way. Uh, honor the authors as they have the microphone, uh, as they'll each read for us for a little bit. And at the end of the event, there will be time for Q&A. So be ready for that. Um, and the chat is public as it always is so that you can show your appreciation of the authors. And I ask you, please show your appreciation of the authors um, since they can hear you applauding. Um, instead, get your, get your keys clicking and your fingers tapping uh, to welcome to the stage, so to speak, our first author, Diksha Basu. Diksha is the author of the novels Destination Wedding, which I have here in its, in its beautiful glory, and the international bestseller, The Windfall. Originally from New Delhi, India, she now divides her time between New York City and Mumbai. Please give a warm welcome to Diksha Basu. Hi, Diksha. Welcome. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, the microphone is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. So as Brian said, I'm going to be reading to you from my new novel, Destination Wedding, which will be out exactly a week from today on the 30th, which is um, very bizarre and very surreal to have a book coming out in the middle of all this. I'm reading to you today from upstate New York where we relocated to my parents' home to write out this phase of the pandemic. We were in Mumbai, India until just a few weeks ago where there's been a complete lockdown, where we literally were not allowed to leave our apartments and uh, we have two toddlers. So we had a difficult eight weeks and are now grateful to be back surrounded by nature and um, in the same time zone as all of you. So thank you, Brian, for having me. I'm going to be reading an excerpt from The Windfall, to, uh, sorry, from Destination Wedding today. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to keep it fairly brief because I don't know how everybody's doing, but my brain is, been fried during this whole global situation. So I will keep it brief and hopefully entertaining and leave you interested enough to buy a copy of the book next week or pre-order it. So, uh, this is uh, based in New Delhi and um, the character that I'm following right now is Mr. Das, who's sort of a middle-aged divorcee from uh, Indian origin from New Jersey, who is now back in Delhi for the summer. Mr. Das waited for Mrs. Sethi near the India International Center at the Lodi Gardens entrance. It was a lovely afternoon, the dust and pollution adding a haze to the air that was quite romantic and diffused the sun. A fat street dog wearing a sweater lay lazily near the entrance, its tail swatting away flies every few seconds. Mr. Das was tempted to have a similar afternoon. Something about India always made him want afternoon naps. It was a habit that started during the long summers in Calcutta when he was a little boy. He would come home from school and have lunch, usually rice and dal with steamed potatoes followed by a fish curry and dessert. Always dessert. His father used to have a spoonful of sugar after every meal, even breakfast, if there wasn't dessert at home. His father was a family doctor who had his clinic attached to the house, so on the one hand, 
he was always around, but on the other hand, he was never really around and always at work. He had regular clinic hours from 10 a.m. until 7 p.m., and he reserved his evenings to do house calls and hold free clinic hours for poor people. Mr. Das used to resent those poor people lined up outside their gate with the illnesses and ailments that would keep his father in his clinic until long after he had gone to sleep. He never saw his father take time off. On most days, the servant, Kartik, would take a tray of food to the clinic for lunch, and Mr. Das would look at the empty tray return an hour later. On occasion, his father came into the main house for lunch, his stethoscope hanging off his neck, but he spent most of lunch on the phone diagnosing patients who were too old or too sick to come and see him. Once his father left or the empty tray returned, Mr. Das would take a bath and have a long afternoon nap before waking up to do his homework and play cricket with the neighboring children. He thought of that now as he waited for Mrs. Sethi. A young couple pulled up on a motorbike, the man with the helmet on, the woman sitting behind him side saddle in a salwar kameez with her dupatta draped around her hair and face to protect it from the pollution. She jumped off the back of the bike and untied the dupatta as the man put the bike into park and removed his helmet. He smiled at her and she turned away from his smile as if they were in the middle of a conversation. She went off a few steps ahead of him and he tossed his motorbike keys in the air, caught them, put them in his pocket and rushed to catch up with her. He grabbed her elbow and spun her around and they both disappeared into the gardens. That was what new love was supposed to look like, Mr. Das worried. What kind of future could he have with Mrs. City when most of their years were already in the past? What were her afternoon rituals, he wondered. What was her childhood like? What did her parents do? Were they alive? Did it matter? Are those questions you even ask someone over 50? And would he ever know her as well as he knew Ratha? Was this all a fool's errand? Neil, came Mrs. Sethi's voice from behind him. He spun around and said, do you sleep in the afternoons? Mrs. Sethi laughed and said, well, hello to you too. And no, I don't usually sleep in the afternoons. I find it depressing. You know, it can be so tempting, especially in the hot summers and also in the cold winters here, but I don't like it. I like to keep my days busy and occupied. You know, these days I'm volunteering at a school for poor children. I should be there today as well, but well, that's the problem with volunteering, isn't it? I take days off whenever I want to. I really ought to be more disciplined. But anyway, that's a long answer to an easy question. Why do you ask? Do you sleep in the afternoon? Not since I was a child, Mr. Das said. In Calcutta, my father was a doctor. Where do I begin to tell you about a life that's so old? Well, I think we've been doing a good job so far, Mrs. Sethi said. She pointed to her wrist and said, I started wearing a Fitbit. Do you mind if we walk? Mr. Das smiled and showed her his wrist as well and said, let's walk. Although I find it much more challenging to try and maximize my step count while minimizing my actual steps. Mrs. Sethi laughed loudly and Mr. Das decided it didn't really matter what her parents used to do and whether or not she slept in the afternoon for now, he was going to enjoy Lodi Gardens and the autumn sun and a walk with a woman who seemed to enjoy his company. Tina's going to join us this afternoon. I hope that's okay, he said. Mr. Das looked up at the ruins in the middle of the garden and marveled at how majestic Delhi could be. It always amazed him that centuries-old tombs could exist, scattered in the midst of chaotic, crowded Delhi, surrounded by acres and acres of green grass and walking paths open to the public, free of charge. When they had visited here when Tina was young, Mr. Das always suggested picnics in Lodi Gardens, but Radha thought it was more hassle than it would be worth. Packing all the food and drinks, the plates, Tina's toys, a sheet to sit on, water bottles, napkins, and for what? To sit out in the sun and the dust and worry about flies settling on their food? And yes, that was probably all true and fair, but Mr. Das thought it was worth the hassle, worth the worries about the dust and the heat. One group of men and women was celebrating a birthday and the remnants of a large cake lay in an open cardboard box. There were several flies on the cake, but none of the people seemed to mind or care and they continued to eat from their plastic plates and laugh and talk. That looks nice, Mrs. City said. Picnics seem like such a hassle, Mr. Das said. Why had he said that? Well, it certainly is easier to eat at home without all the flies buzzing around, Mrs. City said. But my husband loved picnics and I learned to start enjoying them as well. 
My rule was always that we don't bring sweet food and we bring food that won't have any remnants like a sandwich. Nothing with chicken bones or big lemongrass and leaves that need to be left aside at the end of the meal. Oh, and it was always an argument because our maid used to make the most delicious pomfret fry and my husband loved that, but I never agreed to bring those because of the hassle. So we'd stop at sugar and spice in Khan Market and pick up sandwiches only. You know, it was still fun and the cleanup was much easier, but in retrospect, I suppose the pomfret fry wouldn't have been so hard either. I could have just packed one extra plastic bag for all the garbage and some wet wipes for our fingers. Anyway, never mind now. Mr. Das tried to picture a young Mrs. Sethi sitting on a sheet and eating a sandwich with the dust particles moving toward her in the rays of the sun. It was an easier image than picturing her sifting through a whole pomfret to free the flesh from, of the fish from the bones. The fresh smell of marijuana wafted towards them and Mrs. Sethi inhaled deeply and said, I always loved that smell. Of drugs? Mr. Das asked, unable to hide his shock. You like drugs? Mrs. Sethi laughed loudly. She shook her head and looked over at Mr. Das, looking wide-eyed at her. America makes everyone so conservative, she said. Marijuana is hardly a drug. It's better than the anti-anxiety drugs everyone is hopped up on all the time. Oh my God, listen, I sound like an addict. I rarely smoke, but come on, Neil. We're children of the 60s. Don't tell me you've never done any drugs. I haven't, Mr. Das said. I've never even smoked cigarettes. Well, no, I did once, but I hated it. I tried ecstasy on a cruise in Halong Bay last year, Mrs. Sethi said. I loved it. Can you imagine? I went on an organized tour of Vietnam for single Indian women. And at first that sounded like just about the saddest thing I've ever heard of, but I went and it ended up being one of the best two weeks of my life. There were 25 year old women and one 70 plus year old spinster and everything in between. And it was so refreshing. <laughs> no more ecstasy for me now, but my gosh, it was fun. That's one of the few things I never told Meenal about. Mr. Das looked over at Mrs. Sethi, not sure how to respond. None of this was the India he remembered. When he had first heard of Mrs. Ray's matchmaking agency for widows, he had expected to be set up with some old lady wearing a synthetic sari and orthopedic shoes and maybe sprouting a chin hair. But here was Mrs. Sethi, glamorous in her raw silk workouts, drinking port from Portugal and confessing to having tried drugs on a cruise and not hiding any of it. And here was Mr. Das coming across as the conservative old man from New Jersey. A bee buzzed near Mr. Das and he frantically tried to move it away from his face. He knew there was nothing less manly than a man trying to escape a determined bee. And Brian, I'll stop there. Oh, so good. Thank you, Diksha. Thank you Thank so you. much. You guys show some show some uh, <laughs> appreciation for Thank for you, Ian. <laughs> in the uh, in the comments there. I um I loved Diksha's first novel, The Windfall. It was similarly to just at least the taste we heard, uh, just so sharp and smart and so also just very funny. And also your um you write older characters so wonderfully. Um, that was so much fun. I'm so excited to read this. I'm putting in here a link. Uh, it is the Destination Wedding is not out for officially for one more week, but you can pre-order it at uh, bookshop.org and, and they will have it sent to you as soon as, as soon as it releases. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah. Um, great. Moving right along. Uh, next up, we have Annie Kim. Annie Kim is a poet, an ex-lawyer, and a violinist. Her books are Eros Unbroken, winner of the 2019 Washington Prize, and Into the Cyclorama, winner of the Michael Waters Poetry Prize, a finalist for the Forward Indies Best Poetry Book of the Year. Uh, Annie Kim's poems have appeared or are forthcoming in journals such as Beloit Poetry Journal, The Cincinnati Review, Four Way Review, The Kenyon Review, Narrative, Plume and Pallades, a graduate of Warren Wilson College's MFA program for writers and the recipient of fellowships from the Virginia Center for Creative Arts and Hambidge Center, Kim works at the University of Virginia School of Law as the Assistant Dean for Public Service. She teaches poetry and legal writing and writes micro book reviews for DMQ Review. And she is here tonight 
to read to us. Welcome, Annie. Thank you, Brian. Hi, everybody. If you hear jazz music in the background, I don't know, but there's a lot of jazz coming from the windows. It's sort of nice. So <laughs> let me know if you have problems hearing me. It's great to be here. So I'm going to read from my new book, Arrows Unbroken. And I think I'm going to start with a poem called Castrato, because everyone loves Castrato. <laughs> so I'm just going to show you, because it's sort of a funky poem, and you see a lot of left and right. A lot of this book I wrote in what I call counterpoint. So in some ways it's my voice and in this poem, it is the voice of the speaker talking about a scene with her therapist. And the other half of the poem is talking about Castrati and how in the 18th century, they were really the rock stars of the age. So I'm just gonna read a little bit of this poem, Castrato. I want to be a boy, you tell the man who analyzes you, free of desire. He nods, lights flashing off his thin gold spectacles. No one called the singing boys castrati to their face. So evirato, meaning one unmanned, musico, one making music. Boys aren't free of desire, of course, though not by ordinary means. Fingers pressing keyboard, lips against a cold silver mouthpiece. No, the singer's body turned to supple balsam, stretched over the years until it forms that frame beloved by engineers, strength, endurance, rage, range. You uncross your legs, recross, left over right. Beneath you, the vintage leather cushion sinks. It's the idea that they aren't committed yet until those sheer adolescent ribs ascend like arches in a nave not merely the idea of being holy, no, the blood and the meat. Only then is the sacrifice complete. Out the window, a crane lifts, staccato drilling. I'm sorry, the man says, waving all this construction. It seems appropriate, they say. Only then will the whole frame sing, become a building large enough to contain the singer's longing, all his longing, all our own. But no, what you told him wasn't true. What you want is to feel everything, desire as a scarlet tape beneath clear casing. What you want is not the package, solid in your hands, but pleasure in the pulling, ripping off the plastic. Enough to let us watch him grow transparent, liquid, dim in the dusk as a cool glass bowl. And who are we to question? We who bend our ears to listen. So the next poem I'm gonna to read to you is one from my practice days, going back to one of the first uh, years when I was working at a large law firm, I was very unhappy, and it's called Buildings Roman 1999. And Buildings Roman just means a novel or a story about one's education coming out in the world. It was late in the empire of concrete. Vultures like to perch on the austere ledge outside my window, scouting the horizon. Think of angels, then think their opposite. All the things we ache to hide flung open, soft, too soft, like a newborn barely formed. They were cold, I think. Sun dried their feathers. I was lonely, a head above a desk, ready to plunge into the glinting river called the beltway below my office, catch like a pebble in a wheel's stainless spokes. This was before the towers fell, before the dot-com bubble burst, before Gitmo, Dodd-Frank, Frodo and the Lord of the Rings. All language to me then seemed violent, all metaphor, poignant, even suspect. Driving to work, was that a metaphor? Falling asleep on the couch work paid for, stumbling toward the bed in my work clothes, stripping in the dark, which was the old dark. The man who was my tailor, a Korean, I remember how he'd squat beside my feet pushing pins into the fabric here and there, how he'd raise a stick of chalk, press firmly, a hyphen, a hash mark snowy on the cloth. 
how he'd pause to look up from time to time and catch me standing still in his mirror, the image of me staring at the mirror. Everything is worth your look, I'd like to tell that self. Everything is still beautiful, even if you have no words to say it. The next poem I'm gonna read is one of a couple of poems in the book with the word Eros in it, in it. This one's called Breaking Up with Eros. This morning, for example, I miss your heat, how you flare my skin into a sun, whipping my cold dead planets into orbit. To slip beyond the body's gate, glide through its chain link fence, I need to find something beyond just the physical. I've had enough from column A. Proof you're more Apollo, less Saturn devouring his son. Mostly, I want to be done with you. Take a match to my fingers, grip the shiny toilet with both hands, heave. Then it's night again. I'm out, walking back after dinner, the air soft as chalk on heavy paper. My pores are open, my ears open. I feel the bricks of the courthouse crumbling, smell the ivy crawling across them, bittersweet. It's you I want again, your monstrous light knocking my stained glass window, black ink of you, raining swift down parched map of me, blurring all my capitals. That at least was irreparable. I think the final poem I'm going to read, I'll just read the first part. It's a longer poem called The Hydrangeas. And it's, uh, it's about time when hydrangeas are blooming in Charlottesville. So it seems, it seems timely. The Hydrangeas. All winter, they curled like parchment, a Band-Aid torn off in the shower, stiffening into final shape. Because you believed that survival means no one can teach you how to live. Strength appears gradually from suffering. You hurried past them. Snow flung its iron cape over their heads. Then one day, nearly April, all the little crocus pinged. Death under such circumstances being out of place. You fetched your clippers, crouched beside the bush. What dropped into your bag was weightless. Because to live, we must forget, at least pretend, they're back today, as if nothing bad had happened. Blue as in the Quattrocento painting of a dying nymph, where the mountain glides into a clear-bodied bay. This early in the summer, there is nothing you can do. They will become more and more themselves, intensify in color satisfy their simple wants through sun and rain. Unlike us, the growing doesn't cast a shadow. Unlike poetry, they feel nothing below their surface. No one tells them, dimpling in the sun, remember this. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Annie. That was exquisite. Thank you so much. Everyone show some just some love for Annie. That was amazing. Um, just want to kind of sit with that for a minute. That was really, that was really cool. I'm going to put a link up here. Um, they're really beautiful, such beautiful poems. And uh, I'm excited to see what they look like on the page. To order a copy of Annie's poetry collection, Eros Unbound, there's a link there. Um, to go, um, please, I ask support, support our authors, support independent booksellers and book publishers. Um, thank you again, Annie, that was really cool. Um, all right, and our final, final reader for the evening is Zaina Arafat. Zaina is a Palestinian American writer. Her stories and essays have appeared in publications including the New York Times, Granta, The Believer, Virginia Quarterly Review, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, BuzzFeed, Vice, and NPR. She holds an MA in International Affairs from Columbia University 
and an MFA from the University of Iowa, and is a recipient of the Arab Women Migrants from the Middle East Fellowship at Jack Jones Literary Arts. She grew up between the United States and the Middle East, and she currently lives in Brooklyn. And You Exist Too Much is her first novel. Please give a warm welcome to Zaina Arafat. Hi, Zaina, welcome. Hi, how are you? It's nice to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You've got it, the mic is yours. Cool, I'm just gonna read from um, the middle of the book, but it doesn't really need any mm, setup, I don't think. Okay, uh, brrr, all right. Kate and I had been secretly sleeping together for almost a month when I noticed a bruise on her upper thigh. What's that, I asked. As the question left my mouth, I feared I wouldn't want to hear the answer. Oh, Blake, she said. He does that when I'm on top of him. Kate was a best looking senior superlative, field hockey captain, Camelite smoking, dead bootleg listening straight woman. She was also my freshman year college roommate. Blake was a golden dreadlocked, sharp nosed surfer. He was a townie and older than both of us. Kate had been sleeping with him for two months. I pretended not to mind. In the light of day, she and I had never spoken about our nights. The closest we came to of talking about it was the morning after the first time. We'd gone out for her birthday the night before to the bar where I worked. She wore a billabong hoodie that hugged her torso. Over drinks, I'd given her a present, David Gray's white ladder. After opening her, grif her gift, she leaned across the table and kissed me on the cheek. I could smell blue moon on her breath. We ordered stuffed oysters, a questionable choice at a college dive. A preset 80s mix blared through the speakers. We got up to dance when Take On Me came on, moving our bodies closer and shimmying our way to the floor, then grabbing onto each other to pull ourselves back up. I could feel people watching and I liked it. Once home, we put on the CD. It was whiny, brooding, melodramatic, and we lay side by side to listen. Nothing out of the ordinary until she began caressing my face, tracing my eyebrows, my nose, my lips. Then she kissed me. Nervous, I stopped her. I don't wanna ruin our friendship, I said. It was a line from movies, what the girl always said when a guy friend made a move. Kate tilted her head back a little too far and laughed. Don't worry, she said, we're just, you know, experimenting. So I didn't worry. Besides, I wasn't attracted to Kate, so maybe it was safe to let her experiment with me. But when I woke up the next morning and glanced at her beside me, still asleep, the danger was apparent. She looked different than she had the day before. How had I never noticed her long brown lashes, her strict elegant nose, her pink pastel lips, I slid out of bed and tiptoed to my side of the room. I had no desire to leave her, but was afraid that waking up beside each other would be too jarring. It was the first day of spring break. We were spending the week road tripping along the Florida coast with her friends. It was a 13 hour drive to South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, our first stop. After about 30 minutes, I heard Kate shifting in her bed. What time is it, she called out from under the covers, her voice muffled by the comforter. Still early, I said. After that, we said nothing to each other as we packed on opposite sides of the room. I filled the silence with paranoid speculation. Was she ashamed by what we'd done? Had it been awful for her? Or had she been too drunk to remember? For a moment, I worried that I had imagined it. But no, she had made the first move. And it had happened. I could still smell her on my pajamas. In the car on the way to pick up her friends, we slowed to a stop at a traffic light. So, she said, does this mean we can't join the military? Over the next week, we made out in Fort Lauderdale, Boca Raton, Miami, Key West. She'd drop a quick kiss on my cheek when no one was looking, touch my thigh under tables, climb into my sleeping bag after everyone else had passed out, we returned home and continued. Three weeks after Florida, I watched her leave the bar with Blake in the middle of my set. I'd never seen him before, and I asked the bartender who he was. 
Apparently, he was a local craftsman. He'd been in Costa Rica for the past few months on an extended surfing trip. He had honey-colored dreadlocks and a deep tan. I kept eyeing him, watching him order a succession of red stripes and greet the numerous women who came up to hug him. He seemed equally excited to talk to each of them, and I imagined that every last one of them walked away feeling wanted. I noticed him noticing Kate, which triggered deep panic. I kept looking over as he subtly inched his way closer to where she was sitting. I wanted to cry when I saw him tap her on the shoulder, then offer a little wave when she turned around to see who it was. A good move, I thought to myself. I overheard him ordering another beer and asking if she wanted one as well, which she did. Hey, the chef called out to me, order up, orders in fact. I looked to the kitchen window and saw several steaming plates waiting to be carried out. I had no choice but to turn away from the horrific scene just as they were laughing about something. Before heading to the kitchen, I reached over the bar and poured myself a shot of Jägermeister, then another. The place was packed and I could only catch snippets of them talking. Why did they keep laughing? What was so funny? I thought I might die when she tapped his stomach, the lines of his six pack visible through his shirt. But no, that came later as I watched him drop a 20 on the bar, take her hand and lead her out the front door. After they left, I drank three rail royales, the house specialty consisting of a shot of liquor in the rail and, every, and a splash of Sprite. I clocked out, got in my car and backed into a dumpster. I'm not sure how long I'd been sitting there when a cop appeared and tapped on the plastic driver's side Jeep window. Instead of unzipping it, I opened the door and spilled out of the car. She's sleeping with someone else, I cried as I stumbled into the policeman and I'm falling in love with her. He collected me in his arms as I thrashed against his chest, tipsy passerby stopping to view the spectacle. I didn't see Kate until the following night. I took the campus bus back to the dorms after my shift and as it approached my stop, I was dreading the sight of her. When I got to our room, she was sitting on the couch eating a bowl of Easy Mac. Hey, she said, where have you been? I told her about what happened after she left the bar. He dropped the charge from a DUI to an underage possession, I said. I still have to pay a fine, too, for the dumpster. Kate didn't, remind me, didn't, Kate didn't respond. Did you hear me, I asked. She stood up and threw the bowl at my head, something I'd only ever seen my mother do. It shattered against the wall as I dodged out of the way. Orange elbow noodles splattered across the wall. You think it's my fault, she yelled, don't you? You think it's my fault this happened to you? At that moment, I knew. Her guilt, encouraged by my immediate surrender and lack of resistance, would eventually destroy us. At the same time, it would be my only weapon against her. I'll stop there. Thanks. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you, Zena. Everyone give Zena a, a warm... <laughs> Yeah, claps. That was that was that was very cool. Um, Jägermeister, though. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh, it's been a long time. Yeah, <laughs> Jägermeister. <laughs> Putting the uh, the link here to get a copy of of Zena Aravat's new novel. You exist too much. You can click right there. And Zena, I love that you've got your 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 setup uh, back there so that we oh, can- yeah. Well, it's because the book just launched. So like, I, I don't normally do that. <laughs> but like, no, it's, it's important that these- But I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. Um, well, Ian and, and Alexa, you guys are attentive uh, regulars. If you would like to ask a question, you can. Um, let me know. I'm going to start though. I have a question for the three of you because all of you read tonight about love. Um, and I was just so impressed with how, um, I don't know, just how fully you manifested the, the, the emotions of the characters on the page. And I was wondering what kind of work goes into doing that um, when, you're, when you're writing and trying to kind of create that sense that um, two characters or, or, you know, are having a, actually having like sparks flying in between them or some tension. Um, yeah, any, any advice, any thoughts? 
Zaina, do you want to start? I mean, I guess you just have to channel some love experience. Or for me, I usually have to challenge some either some love experience or perhaps just experience of desiring in some way um, and capture the emotion behind it and then like locate it in a specific narrative involving two fictional characters. <laughs> so I just like take emotions that I myself have experienced in some context um, and try and like use that emotion to drive the telling of the story of the love story. Gotcha. So kind of like a transmutation or something. Yeah. 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 Precisely like that. Yeah. Diksha, what about you? I don't know, Brian. That question is loaded. You want to peek behind the curtain and not my process. <laughs> uh, I, 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 don't have a, I don't have a clear answer on that because um, if I did, if I had a clear cut answer on how I do it each time I do it, it wouldn't feel like such a challenge. I'd be able to figure it out myself. But I'm, uh, for me, it's still a struggle. For me, it's uh, writing this and writing uh, every time I write, every time I sit down on a, uh, with a new page, it's a struggle. And it's funny that you ask about this because for me, what, I'm, um, what I enjoy write, writing about a lot and exploring and Brian, you mentioned this, is the second chance at love. So I really like uh, writing about and thinking about sort of middle-aged love. And especially because these days with, you know, divorce rates are, um, divorce is socially acceptable in uh, many cultures. It's uh, people have longer life expectancies. The concept of middle age is changing. So one of the things that just interests me, and that's obviously not from um, personal experience because I'm on my first and hopefully only marriage, but <laughs> what really interests me to explore just as an exercise, and this is a theme I, I uh, explored heavily in the windfall and the theme I come back to in Destination Wedding is the idea of a second big love or, a, or, you know, or second, third, fourth, whatever number it may be, but not that first idea of happily ever after. So that's something that I certainly is not a case of write what you know, but it is definitely a case of something that I find interesting and continue to work through. So for me, it is when I write about that specifically, it's uh, more of um, an exercise in mental experimentation myself. Yeah, what you do, and you do it very, so wonderfully. I think also it's just so so uh, very um, refreshing to read, like when you know characters who have this sense of history about themselves and have this sense of who they are as characters, you know, colliding with with someone else who has the same, and yet they still have the same kind of sexual attraction to one another and curiosity about one another and optimism about where the relationship might go. And yet they come with all of this, this, this great history as well. Yeah, and often more, um, often less willing to change. The older you get, the less uh, willing to change you are. And so then, so then what changes in what you look for a partner if you're not, if you're not sort of shifting shape in order to fit into their crevices? And what happens um, if you're both these marble structures? Mm. So interesting. Such great narrative possibility. Annie, how about you? Well, I feel like I only write about very problematic love, <laughs> but Eros is in the title of the book, Eros Un Unbroken. And so the, the kind of Eros I'm talking about mostly is a little bit broader, a little bit more abstract. So I have a quote from the beginning of the book from Carl Jung from the Red Book, and um, Eros is not form giving, but form fulfilling. It is the wine that will be poured into the vessel, it is not the bed and direction of the stream, but the impetuous water flowing in it. And so I got really interested while writing this book in the concept of love as sort of a broader force, where even if we are not the people directly in love, like we still feel some sense of love from other people, um, I write about a friendship uh, between two men, historical characters in the 18th century, my own relationship with my father. And so these are all kind of very different forms of love, but trying to find some commonality there, I guess, and seeing it as a, a more of a life force rather than as something that's very tied between two people. And would you say that, um, I mean, we're, we're a question that, uh, that I also was so fascinating is with your, with your background in, you know, with music playing and then also in, in legal 
writing and, and being a lawyer, do those um, passions channel into your creative work at all? Or are these kind of separate rooms in your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the music part does a lot. So there are a lot of poems in this book. There's one called Violins, Violence. So there's a lot of metaphors about music and my playing does infuse some of the poems in here. So that, that's been a source of, of interest for me. Less so with the law. I mean, I'm teaching different things right now in, in the law school, but that's what it feels like a compartmentalized different self in a lot of ways. But that's fine. I'm good at that. <laughs> That's cool. Zaina, what about you? Do you, you have an MA in international studies? Does that play into your, um, your fiction, your interest in writing fiction um, and, and your essay work as well? Or is that something that was a kind of a different part of your life? No, I mean, I, I so, so as a Palestinian, I mean, the idea of being a, like, I guess, creative writer wasn't really something that, um, I, it's not that it was off, it wasn't discouraged. It just wasn't really encouraged in my household. And I always was, you know, really drawn to conflict resolution for kind of obvious reasons, right, as a Palestinian. And so I, when I did my master's in international affairs, a lot of my goal was to write journalistically around um, Arab-Israeli topics. And from there, I kind of just kept going in a more just creative direction and found that that would be maybe a better way to achieve some of the goals that I hope to achieve um, when it came to like challenging stereotypes and misperceptions. So about Arabs um, and Palestinians for some more specifically. So it's sort of like, I mean, doing a master's in international affairs kind of led me into fiction writing also because my writing has an international component. Like my novel is set between the States and the Middle East. And I still write journalism and essays around Arab characters in the diaspora and in the Middle East as well. So, so yeah, it factors in still. <laughs> I'm teaching a class in like a week on international affairs too. So it happens to come in handy for that um oh yeah. wow like writing like creative writing wise or just sort of. i think it's i don't really know yet i just know that it's an ir class that's yeah there's a writing component but um but yeah it's, so it still factors into my life <laughs> and my writing yeah yeah no i mean i as someone myself who uh was i was had many not many i had at least two careers before writing so I'm, I, and those interests all kind of still kind of circle around and funnel in so it's always always fascinating to me to hear how other people's passions and interests and their histories kind of come with them onto the page no it's true it's, i find that so interesting as well diksha what about you with acting i mean you had a you had a career as a as a as an actress and did that teach you things about writing that or does that inspire your writing in any way or is that something yeah absolutely I, I read a lot of dialogue I write dialogue heavy work and I think um, that comes from um, always really enjoying dialogue I enjoyed reading screenplays I enjoyed reading scripts I love reading plays so I, I do write a lot of dialogue and one of the things that well two things one thing I find interesting is about how um, dialogue is never A A B B C C everyone's always talking across purposes so I find that really interesting. Uh, the other thing I was going to say about acting is, I, you know, especially where television and film is right now, uh, television in particular, there's so much good television. And I really find it not, I, the two mediums between writing and uh, writing fiction and writing for screens, they can learn so much from each other. I think often, not often, sometimes some writers do willingly um, give up on the entertainment value that the screen pr provides. I really like straddling the space between both. And that's why I think I write a lot of dialogue. And that is definitely comes from having acted. I speak my dialogue out to myself as I write it, especially as I edit it. And I, um, I think it also helps me set the scene <laughs> just because I, I still think theatrically, I still think in terms of a set or a, uh, or a stage. Hmm. You certainly, I mean, I haven't read the new one yet, but it's certainly in the windfall felt that kind of energy of the scenes, they kind of, they kind of hit their beats so wonderfully and just kind of like, 
ended at just the just the right moment. You know, the momentum of the narrative was so was so wonderful. But um, thank you, thank you. I hope that this book does the same. Yeah, no, I'm excited. And okay, final question. I hear. I know it's almost bedtime for the for the kids. Um, but can you? Uh, I, I'm interested to hear from all of you. But Diksha, maybe you can start because your your cover. Can you? It's so beautiful and um, and bright. Can you tell us about like the 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 what's the the story behind it? The story is that it was a one shot cover. I loved it that you know um, Valentine put it together. They sent it. The very first one with no tweaks was what I loved. My agent loved. My editor loved. Everybody loved, and it was the easiest cover to come to. And I'm so grateful for it, and I'm so excited. And I hope bookshops in uh, whatever form exist in a week that <laughs> <laughs> we can no longer even know about a week from now because I just I got my final copies just a few days ago and. Uh, it's so eye-catching and I love it so much. And that's really, there's no story behind it except that it just worked right from the start. Well, that's probably the best story because it's really <laughs> wonderful to hear when that, like first time, first go around kind of ends up hitting, hitting, you know, just being magic. So, it was yeah. very satisfying. And all the international editions have bought the same cover from Valentine's. So it's going to have the same cover all around the world. And I'm very excited about it. Oh, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Zaina, Thank what about you? you? Um, well, I mean, I, I, when I saw my cover, I just absolutely loved it. I mean, the designer, Nicole Caputo, it just seemed to, um, get it right from the start. I mean, it was initially, I think the colors were a little less bold and then we went bolder and it just felt totally right. And I mean, it has like, you know, the outline of a woman's body in the background with the sort of thing across that's uh, I think speaks to the theme, some of the themes in the book um, and the title as well. So I just, I, I've been really happy. I couldn't have asked for a better cover, I think. Um, it just fits thematically and aesthetically and I'm really happy about it. So yeah. yeah. Very, very awesome. Yeah, well I know you uh, catapult and soft skull and counterpoint and all that that whole that whole team of of publishers have such great their covers are so beautiful um so it's no it's yeah really they do a great job uh, and annie how about you so poets are very choosy about their artwork and we often choose our own artwork especially for which is most of what Polish poetry publishing is, is indie publishing so this is actually a, a detail from a 16th century painting by lucas Cranach the elder who's a Northern European painter. And this is Judith with the head of Holofernes. So you remember the biblical tale about Judith and how she cut off the head of this Assyrian general. He was drunk and asleep in his tent and she liberated her people. So in their actual painting, there would be the head down here somewhere and her wearing a magnificent ostrich plumed hat, but it's just the detail. And I loved it because I love this painter. And um, there's something about the neck the, the, the necklace around her neck that I was remembering, it's very snake-like. And I have a lot of snake imagery in the book and obviously a lot of interest in violence and male-female relationships. I just thought it was perfect. But I loved how it came out. They did this nice brocade around here too. So, so yeah, yeah, that's the story behind my book. Very cool and very, very richly read, of course, very desire and, yes. Yes. and, and love and sex, all that is so good in life. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you three so much, Annie and Zena and Diksha. It's been really wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. And congratulations on your books and Diksha very soon. Congratulations on yours coming out next thank week. You. Um, yeah, it was such a, such a treat um, to hear all three of you read. And um, uh, we'll, the antibody will be back next week uh, on Tuesday, June 30th with Britt Bennett. Michelle Philgate and Lynn Steger Strong. Um, so come on back for that. And uh, thank you to, uh, to the readers and to the uh, Lit Hub and to our audience. Um, it's wonderful to see you guys. And uh, until next week, stay optimistic and stay healthy and keep reading books. And uh, yeah, thank I'll see you then. Thank you. Nice thank you. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys. Thank you.